This is a talk given by Rudolf Kaunov at the meeting of the American Philosophical Association, Pacific Division, at Santa Barbara on December 29, 1959, on theoretical concepts in science. For many years, it has been found useful in the analysis of the language of science to divide the terms of this language into three main kinds, logical terms, including those of pure mathematics, observational terms, which I shall call for brevity old terms, and finally, theoretical terms or T terms, sometimes also called constructs. It is true that it is hardly possible to draw a clear cut boundary line between O terms and T terms. That is to say, the choice of an exact line is somewhat arbitrary. But it does not matter exactly where the boundary line is drawn, but roughly speaking, it seems from a practical point of view important to make the distinction between terms like blue, red, hard, soft, hot, and cold on the one hand, not as terms for sense data, but as properties of observable things, and likewise terms for relations among things, one being near the other or greater than the other, and so on. And on the other hand, terms like electromagnetic field and uh, electric charge or charge densities and uh, photons and neutrons and so on, terms which occur in theoretical science and for which we cannot claim that we have knowledge concerning singular facts directly by just looking at a thing. So the first we say are observational terms or O terms, the second theoretical terms or T terms, sometimes they have been called constructs or theoretical constructs or abstract constructs. And then with respect to the sentences, we make a threefold division as you see it here in the uh, well, uh, 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 oh, yeah. Would it not be better here so that you think for the second uh, mm -hmm. backward there? Well I can go to the back. All right. So here we have the threefold uh, division of sentences on the basis of this twofold division of the terms into sentences whose only descriptive constants are observational, and that is the observation language on the left hand side, or observational sentences, O sentences. There I make a distinction between the, uh, the uh, L sub O, the observation language in the narrow sense, which is logically restricted to a first order logic, and the extended observation language, which I call LO prime, which contains just the same descriptive terms as LO, but in addition, not only first order logic, but a rich logic containing the whole of mathematics. It doesn't matter either in set theoretic form or in type theory form, there we have the whole of uh, higher logic, including mathematics. Then on the right hand side, we have those sentences which contain as descriptive terms only theoretical terms. And in the middle, we have then mixed sentences. And the postulates which make out uh, the theory, which constitute the theory, are partly theoretical sentences, and we call them T postulates, as for instance, 
laws of theoretical physics, and partly mixed sentences, or correspondence postulates, and for short, C postulates, which are mixed sentences because they contain both theoretical terms and observation terms, they correspond to what uh, Campbell would have called the dictionary between the two languages, what Reichenbach would have called correlative definitions of terms occurring in axiom systems of theoretical physics or any theoretical science, and what Bridgman might have called the operational postulates or operational rules. So this is the distinction which we make between terms and between sentences. And one of the most important characteristics of the T terms, and therefore also of all sentences containing T terms, at least if they are occur, occurring not in a vacuous way, is that their interpretation is not a complete one. Because we cannot specify in an explicit way by just using theoretical uh, observational terms what we mean by the electromagnetic field. We can say if there is a distribution of the electromagnetic field in such and such a way, then you will see a light blue. And if so and so, then you will see or feel or hear this and that. But we cannot give a sufficient and necessary condition entirely in the observation language for there being an uh, electromagnetic field having such and such a distribution. Because in addition to observational consequences, the content is too rich. It contains more than we can exhaust by the observational consequence. So this is the original setup. And uh, on the basis of that, we want to make a distinction between uh, logical truths and factual truths. I believe that such a distinction is very important for the methodology of science. I believe that in order to understand the essential distinction between pure mathematics on the one side and physics, which contains mathematics but in an applied form on the other side, can only be understood if we have a clear explication of the distinction that in traditional philosophy is known under the terms of analytic and synthetic, or necessary truth and contingent truth, or however you may express it. Now, Quine has pointed out that logical truth, really, that here a new distinction should be made, logical truth in the narrow sense, comprises those sentences whose truth is established in deductive logic, plus substitution instances of them which may contain descriptive terms. While, um, say, while there are other sentences which we may regard also as analytic, this example, for instance, as you remember, is no bachelor is married. That is certainly true, but its truth is not a matter of the contingent facts of the world. It is a matter merely of the meaning of the terms. It is true on the basis, of, in virtue of the meanings of the terms, but in distinction to the logical truth in the narrow sense here, also in virtue of the meanings of the descriptive terms. We, if we know the meaning of bachelor and the meaning of married, or at least we know or are told by somebody who understands this language, that these two terms are incompatible, then we know that the term no bachelor is married, is, uh, the sentence is uh, true in virtue of meanings alone, so it is analytic, as uh, Klein would propose to distinguish. So logic goes in a narrow sense, or logic goes in a wider sense, or analytic. And for this letter, for the first, I will take the term L true, capital L hyphen true, as the term for the explicatum, for the second A true. And my main purpose here is to indicate how we can make the distinction between A true and other true, namely factual true sentences, 
not only in the observation language, but also in the theoretical language. In the observation language, we know a way of doing it. I explained that uh, years ago in a paper called Meaning Postulates. I would now call them A postulates, and then say every term that is a logical consequence of the A postulates is then A true. This can easily be done in a language like the observation language, where we presuppose that we are in the possession of a complete interpretation of the term. That need not be done in an explicit way by semantical rules, but just you ask somebody, is this part of the English language completely understood by you? Do you know what you mean by the verbs that you use there? While, as I said before, the terms of the observation language, of the theoretical language are not completely incurred. The interpretation which they have is not learned in the same way as the interpretation of terms like red and blue, which we learn, let's say, as we learn our mother tongue, by hearing uh, how they are applied and imitating these applications and making an unconscious general uh, inductive inference. And so we know now what we mean by red, by hot, and so on. But with electromagnetic field, it is different. There we cannot simply point and say, for electromagnetic field, I mean this and that, or an electromagnetic field having an intensity of so and so much, or vector so and so. We cannot simply point and thereby learn it. We learn it by the postulates. These terms are introduced by the postulates, namely the T postulates, general laws of physics, which connect these terms among each other which obviously is not sufficient to give any meaning to them. And then the second kind of postulates, the C postulates, which connect these terms with those of the observation language, for instance, the term temperature is connected by the C postulate with observational terms, namely a C postulate, which describes how you proceed in constructing a thermometer and constructing its scale then putting the thermometer in the, in a certain liquid, and then reading a certain number, then you are told, take that number as the value of the temperature of that liquid. So here we are given rules which connect certain observables with a theoretical term like temperature. And thereby, then, this term obtains a partial interpretation partial because not in all occurrences of the term temperature can we use this operational definition. It works only for, for let's say, an ordinary thermometer, only in some rather limited interval of the scale. For two low temperatures, for two high temperatures, we must use entirely different methods. So each C postulate applies only to certain cases, and all of them together would not help us to determine uh, temperatures or electric fields and so on, unless we had also the T postulates. So it is then the T postulates together with the C postulates, which give interpretation, or of that interpretation that the T terms have, which is not a full interpretation that we have to keep in mind. But what interpretation they have, they get by the postulates and by the postulates of these two kinds together. Now, when, uh, when the question is raised how to distinguish between sentences whose truth is due to meaning and other sentences, then a sample is especially clearly pointed out. There is a great difficulty in the theoretical language. Hempel uh, was, with some hesitation, I believe, willing to accept the distinction with respect to the observation language. On the one hand, he is influenced by my way of thinking. We are old friends from the days in Germany. On the other hand, he is also influenced by uh, Klein's skepticism with respect to making a clear distinction between factual and logical truths or meaning truths. 
And he pointed, but he pointed out that he can hardly imagine how a distinction could be made also with respect to the theoretical language. Any sense is containing either theoretical terms alone or theoretical and observation terms. For the following reason, the interpretation of the T terms is given by these postulates, not by explicit definitions on the basis of the observation language. But these postulates have a dual role. They have two different functions, each of them, or their totality, fulfills simultaneously, namely, they give some meaning to the terms, and they give some factual information to us. That they give factual information is seen from the fact that if the physicist gives his whole theory to us, then we are in a much better position to predict the weather of tomorrow than if we rely only on a few generalizations which can be um, formulated in the observation language. If you see clouds of such a shape, then tomorrow it will probably rain or something of that time. So the theoretical system of physics certainly gives factual information. But it gives factual information and specification of meaning simultaneously. And Hempel said that makes the concept of a truth entirely elusive because there's hardly to be imagined that we could split up these two functions of the TNC postulates so that we could say this part of them contributes to meaning, and therefore the sentences which rely on that part they are then, uh, if they are true, true due to meaning only, the other are factual sentences. So this is the big problem which, uh, for which I want to propose a solution, namely how to define a truth in the sense of analyticity or truth based on meaning also for the theoretical language. Now, in order to do that, I uh, first will speak of a uh, uh, device that has already been introduced a long time ago by Ramsey. It is the so-called Ramsey sentence, as we call it today, corresponding to any given theory in the theoretical language, or with mixed sentences. Given uh, the theory, I will write it for sure PC, or in a slightly more explicit form. If the observational terms occur in it, of course they occur only in the C postulate, but let uh, T be the conjunction of the T postulate, C of the C postulate, and TC of the of both together, then in order to indicate the descriptive terms occurring, let's write it in the following form, as you see it there, TC, and then the observational terms, O1 and so on, OM, then the theoretical terms, T1 and so on, TM. And we form uh, from this the Ramsey sentence in the following way. We keep the observation terms unchanged, but we replace the theoretical terms by variables. Let's say for T1, we put the, uh, for the constant T1, we put the variable u1 for t2, u2, and so on. If it is in a type system, then it must be variables of the corresponding types. And then we prefix the whole by existential quantifiers, one for each of these n variables corresponding to the n theoretical terms. So we presuppose that there is a finite number of theoretical terms in that language. Now, Ramsey showed uh, that this sentence is uh, what I would propose to call for short O equivalent or observationally equivalent to the original theory, namely the total theory of the TNC postulate, in the following sense. We'll say that the sentence S is O equivalent to a sentence S prime. If all the observational sentences, that is the sentences in L O prime, which follow from S, 
follow also from S prime. So as far as observational consequences are concerned, S and S prime are equivalent. That is meant by O equivalent. Now Ramsey showed that this existential sentence, which we call now the Ramsey sentence, is O equivalent to the theory TC. And practically he drew uh, the following consequence, or he made the following practical proposal. He said the theoretical terms are rather bothersome because we cannot specify explicitly and completely what we mean by them. If we find a way of getting rid of them and still doing everything what we want to do in physics with the original theory which contains these terms, that would be fine, and he proposes to use this existential sentence. You see, in the existential sentence, the T terms do no longer occur. They are replaced by variables, and these variables are bound to existential quantifiers. Therefore, that sentence is in the language LO prime, in the extended observation language. And he said, let's just forget about the old formulation TC, about the T terms, let's just take this existential sentence, and from it, we get all the observational consequences which we want to have. Maybe all those which we can derive from the original theory. Now, the form of the system which I propose makes essential use of the Ramsey sentence, but I do not want to take this radical step, at least uh, here in this form which I shall describe now, I uh, rather say, let's keep the theoretical term, let's keep the old form, and uh, but then I introduce certain distinctions in order to make uh, the desired distinction between a truths and factual truths. And I make that in the following way. I wish to split up the theory TC, the theory in its ordinary form, with the T postulates and the corresponding postulate C, in another way, not into T and C, but in another way, into two sentences, where the one represents the factual content, and I call that P, that is then the physical postulate, and that is synthetic, and on the other hand, in a part which, uh, which is only an A postulate, which gives only meaning specification, partial meaning specification, no more is possible here, and does not convey factual information, and I call that A sub T. By A sub O, I mean the conjunction of all the A postulates or meaning postulates, which were in the observation language, I will not give them. So something like no bachelor is mad or so might occur there, or warm or is a transitive relation or something of that kind. And uh, then for the T terms, I will give an postulate which I call A sub T. After having specified these two, then I will define A truth in the following way. A sentence is A true if it is a logical consequence of A, sub, um, of A sub O and A sub T together. I use there the uh, assertion symbol of the Principia for L2. So that is expressed by what is written there in the, with this uh, symbol. If A, O, and A, T together, L imply S, then I will that, and only in that case will I say that S is an A2 set. So now I must specify what I mean by P and by AT, and then show that the two together really are no more and no less than the old theory, so that I can regard them as a splitting of the old theory into parts. And second, that the one really is merely factor, the other merely specification of me. And I do it in this way that I take as the P postulate the Ramsey sentence of the theory, which I write as TC with an upper left-hand uh, superscript uh, R. 
So RTC, Terenzi sentence, that I take as my P postulate, the physical postulate, as the factual content. And then as the A postulate, A sub T, I take a conditional sentence. Namely, if RTC, then TC, where the if then is the material implication. So these are the two postulates which I propose. And, uh, but this is merely a reformulation of the old theory. This logic is equivalent to the old theory. So I, I want to stress especially this point. I do not propose a new theory. If a theory is given, I merely uh, split it into another way, into uh, three, for, three kinds of postures. And I call that uh, correspondingly forms. I call the first form one, that is the customer form, namely AO, the meaning postures of the observation language, T and C. And now form two, AO, unchanged, AT and P, but AT take something from C and something from T, so A, T, and P are not uh, uh, simply parts of T and C as they occur in the ordinary formulation, but are entirely reformulated. As you see, for instance, that P is the Ramsey sense. So the whole of T and C occurs there, but in a changed form, with the uh, theoretical terms having been eliminated and replaced by value. Now, does this splitting up really, uh, does, uh, does uh, this system of P and AT really fulfill the purpose which I said it should fulfill? I will not show it, but it can be shown in a very uh, simple way that the following three results hold. I call them ABC, they're written there somewhere. The first is that TC is logically equivalent, uh, equivalent to P and A sub T. Well, that uh, in the one direction it follows directly from modus ponens, and in the other direction, obviously from TC we can derive any condition that has TC as a consequence. So this is uh, quite clear. In other words, P and AT together is just the reformulation in another form of the old theory. Second, P is O equivalent to TC. Therefore, and P is in the, as I said before, is in the extended observation language. It does not contain the theoretical term, but it contains all what you might call the observational content. Therefore, it seems to me that P really fulfills its role. It gives us the factual information as far as observations are concerned. And it uh, does certainly not give us any specification of the meanings of the T terms because they do not occur at all in P. On the other hand, uh, AT is of such a kind that, as uh, result C says, the, the uh, Ramsey sentence of AT, so imagine AT, RTC applies TC, this whole now Ramseyite, namely in the second part we have some uh, T terms occur. Replace them by variables V1, V2, and so on, and then put existential quantifiers not before that part, but before the whole sentence. That is then the Ramsey sentence, not of TC, but the Ramsey sentence of A sub T. And it turns out that that sentence is logically true. Since it is a Ramsey sentence, it is in the observation language, and is logically true in the observation language, so it does not have any factual content. Otherwise, AT does not say anything about uh, the world of facts. So all that it does is it gives us some connection uh, between the terms, namely the T terms among themselves and the T terms with the C terms of such a kind that it helps to give a partial interpretation for it, and that is the, uh, the purpose of an A postulate. So in this way, I propose to write the theory 
in the second form. I do not say that this form is essentially superior, so I do not say let's forget the old form, only use this one. The old form is very convenient and for many purposes, perhaps more convenient, because it is the customary form. We find there the, the Maxwell laws and uh, the law of gravitation and such and such physical laws in their customary form. And then we have the C postscripts in their customary form. So that is certainly a very convenient form. The second form has only this purpose. If we want to make the distinction between a truth and factual truth, then this form shows this uh, interpretation in a clear way. Once this interpretation has been made, then we might also uh, introduce the term of P truth, namely all those sentences of the truth language L which are logical consequences of A sub O and A sub T, that is all the A postulates of all the parts of the language, and P, the physical postulates, are called P true, physically true or practically true. So, so uh, here we have then in the diagram there of the classification of the sentences of the total language. They fall, of course, into true and false sentences. Among the true sentences, we have a small subclass, the L2, somewhat larger, including the L2, the A2, this is the analytic class, then the P2, on the other hand, correspondingly, L false, A false, and P false, and intermediate then into uh, the indeterminate sense, L indeterminate, A indeterminate, which means then synthetic and P indeterminate which means, uh, so to speak, contingent, not uh, determined either quantity or negatively by the basic physical law. So this is the uh, uh, classification of the senses which we have. And uh, on the basis uh, of, of this here, I will uh, perhaps first uh, make a reference to publications. The Ramsey sentence has been published posthumously in the book uh, Foundation of Mathematics, which you know, which was published in 1928, was written some years before that. Uh, it has uh, found very little attention until the very last years. Braithwaite refers to it and discusses uh, Ramsey's method in his book but otherwise very little is to be found in the literature. But then Hempel, in a paper, The Theoretician's Dilemma, which was published in the second volume of the Minnesota Studies for the Philosophy of Science, emphasized the great importance of the Ram Ramsey sentence and discussed uh, a number of methodological questions and logical questions of the language of science on the basis of the Ramsey sentence. And uh, on the other hand, he used it also in order to raise unsolved problems, and among them the problem which I mentioned, which he, he thought uh, might perhaps not be solvable, namely making distinction between analytic and synthetic. Now, in addition, he has a more detailed discussion of the whole in an unpublished paper which will appear in the field volume on my philosophy, which we hope will appear towards the end of 1960, it is not quite determined. And uh, what I just explained, my explication of A2, also including the theoretical language, is contained in uh, my unpublished reply to this paper by Hempel, which will occur in the field volume. And a uh, um, uh, much briefer discussion of it is in a, it has been published in a German language paper, which David Kaplan mentioned, the old Wachtungssprache und Theoretische Sprache, which has been published first in the periodical Dialectica, published in Zurich one year ago. And then the whole part and whole double issue of Dialectica is separately published as a test trip for Paul Bernays under the title Logica. And uh, there are my paper and paper of many other authors 
has appeared. Now, I want to raise uh, some questions from a philosophical point of view, which I think are interesting from a philosophical point of view. This is the old question that was already raised by Ramsey, namely, could we in some way perhaps get rid of the bothersome theoretical terms and restrict ourselves to the observation language? He did not yet make the distinction about between LO prime and LO, but I think he might have uh, envisaged when he said observation language the whole, which I now call LO prime. So when I, from now on, when I say observation language, I mean it in the wider sense, including uh, as descriptive terms only the simple observation terms, but a very rich logic. And I shall especially use a special uh, logical symbol, which I shall explain soon, which comes from Hilbert. Now, can we restrict ourselves to the observation language and still to do everything that physicists want to do? This is the practical question. Now, and this proposal is, of course, one way of doing it, namely using the Ramsey sentence, instead of TC. But that has certain, not essential uh, objections, only strong inconveniences. Because uh, think of the following fact. If somebody asks a physicist, give me the whole of your theory, then really Ramsey is right that it doesn't make a much greater inconvenience whether he gives it in the old form, long series of sentences, he says, these are the, my theoretical postulates, and a still longer series of uh, correspondence postulates, or whether he makes it a little bit longer by prefixing uh, some 20, let's say, uh, existential quantifiers and replacing some constants by variables in it. But if we now think of those sentences which are much more frequent when you read in the paper the uh, temperature yesterday in Santa Barbara was so many degrees and then the prognosis for tomorrow tomorrow the temperature probably will be so many degrees how would we express that in LO prime we have no word uh, no symbol there for temperature Temperature in the old language was perhaps t sub, uh, small t sub a, let's say, just the a uh, theoretical term. That has disappeared now. We are in LO, uh, O prime in the language. But there we have a variable, u sub a, which takes its place. But in order to use it and say u sub a for such and such uh, geographical coordinates and such a time point is uh, 100 degrees, so we have to write all the n, let's say, 20 existential quantifiers, all the postulates, theoretical postulates, all the corresponding postulates, and then in the same operand, which is the common operand for the 20 existential quantifiers, and use of eight for such and such coordinates is under degrees. Because if you merely were to write use of uh, eight of such orders as such and such, that would not even be a sentence because there's a free variable in it. It wouldn't mean anything. And it would not help to just add the one quantifier because that doesn't tell you that it is temperature. Temperature, its essential characteristics come from its combination, which are expressed combination and connections with other theoretical terms are expressed in the C postulate in the uh, co combination and connections with the observation terms are expressed in the C postulate. So you must give them in order to give the full sentence. Now that is of course rather cumbersome and we would like very much to get rid of the T terms and still have simple sentences for those simple sentences which the physics uses ever day. Can we do that? Well, we could do it if we found a way of giving explicit definitions for all the theoretical terms in the observation language. 
And this is the question which I want to raise now. Is that possible? Now, I thought very briefly about that question years ago, and I just dismissed it from my mind because it seems so obvious that it is impossible. Everybody knows that the theoretical terms are introduced by Paul Swift because we cannot give explicit definitions of them on the basis of the observational terms alone, even if we add this strong logic. At least that seemed to be the way, and therefore I didn't think any more about it, although if we could do it, of course, that would be a great advantage. Now, it is possible. I found that only a few weeks ago, I know hope I haven't made a mistake, I have not discussed it yet, the trend, except for telling David Kaplan about it, but only briefly. So I will present it here, and if somebody shows that uh, I'm mistaken, I'm very glad before I take all the trouble of writing it in a paper, or the trouble for my wife of transcribing all that is now here on the, on the table. So, uh, in the hope that there may be something in it, I will now present the way of doing uh, this by explicit definitions, which is really so surprising that I still can hardly believe. Before I do it, I introduce a simplifying a notation in the old language for the TC. I write a small t for the n tuple of the t terms, the ordered n tuple t1 and so on to tn. I write small o for the m tuple of the o terms, om down to om. And uh, so I write then, uh, for instance, a sub t in the form of first the I'm this and has then the simple form. There is a U such that T C U O and A sub T, my old uh, A postulate in the theoretical language, has the form if there is a U such that T C U O, then T C T O. Which roughly means this. Let's let's make it clear to ourselves what really, in effect, is said by this A postulate in the form 2. It, say, it says, if there is at least a theoretical entity U, at least one theoretical entity U, if it exists at all, such that it has the relation TC to O. Of course, you remember, U is really now an abbreviation for all the theoretical terms, so it means if these 20 entities exist, which have such and such relations among themselves and such and such other relations to the observational entities, then let the terms T1, T2, and so on down to Tn be understood in such a way that this n tuple is one of those which are in that non-empty class. If the class of those n tuples is not empty, then let T be one of them. This is the meaning of K sub T. We'll come back to that in a moment because it is essential for finding this indeed suggested to me, this intuitive meaning of A T suggested to me the way in which to give explicit definition. Now, in order to give this explicit definition, I make use of a logical constant that has been introduced by Hilbert, and extensive use of it has been made in the uh, work by Hilbert and Bernays, the Grundlagen der Mathematik, this discussed in great detail at the beginning of the second volume of it. It is the so-called epsilon operator, as Hilbert calls it, he writes an expression of it with epsilon subscript x followed by a sentential formula containing x as a free variable, let's say fx. Epsilon x as x, roughly speaking, means this. It stands if fx is not empty, if there's something that is f, the class f is not empty, then epsilon x fx stands for any element of that class. 
it is not specified which one. You see, this is uh, uh, useful in mathematics because according to mathematical reasoning, we often do the following. Perhaps we have no example of an instance for a certain class or certain property of natural numbers or property of real numbers, but we have proved that that class is not empty by showing that if we assumed it were empty, that would lead to a contradiction or in some other way. And then we say, or even if we have instances, but we do not bother to specify which one we mean, then we say, let A be for any one element of that class, meaning by that I will now go on under the assumption that A is an element of the class F, and I will not presuppose anything else about A. So all I will presuppose about A is there is an element of the class, and then I go on and draw my conclusions from it. And indeed, this epsilon operator has been found extremely useful, in, uh, especially in metamathematical uh, consideration. And uh, Hilbert and Bernays give uh, a detailed discussion of its value and its use and to make use of it, and then later also of its eliminability in order to show that it is not essential, that it is introduced for convenience, but uh, we can dismiss it and then prove still the same theorems for another mathematical system which uh, does not contain it. If we use this symbol, then we don't need the quantifiers, the ordinary quantifiers, existential and universal, as a primitive, I, oh, first, uh, you see there Hilbert's axiom, which he gives, which says, if y is an f, in other words, if we know at all that there is something which is f, then epsilon x f y is an f. So what I said is the intuitive meaning of the epsilon expression is expressed by this axiom. That's the only axiom for the epsilon operator. Now, he defines explicitly the existential quantifier, you see the formula on the universal quantifier, and therefore, and then on the basis of his one axiom, he can show all the theorems of first order logic for the quantifier. So, it is actually a very elegant uh, and effective basis of this. Yes. It is also very strong, and that uh, may give rise to some doubts about the legitimacy of its use. I will come to that later. So now I will uh, will characterize the form, which I call form three, which of the system, which contains A sub O and P in the old form, but replaces A T by A T prime, and A T prime consists just of explicit definitions, first of small t, then of uh, t sub 1, and so on. The explicit definition of t is very simple. I call it A t 0, and it is the following. t equals epsilon u t c u o. In other words, t is the epsilon object of Tc. Uh, the epsilon operator was sometimes called also by Hilbert a selection operator because it selects an arbitrary element of the class. And now you see, when you look at this definition, this definition was suggested to me by the meaning of the AT, which I said before, which told us that if there is anything at all that stands to O in the relation T C, then T should be should have this relation. Therefore I said, then T is just the selection object, that is the object which we can name by the epsilon operator applied to T C. And so it suggested this theorem. Of course, it suggested it only didn't prove that the theorem comes to the intended result, but that can easily be shown. I will not go into details, but merely mention what can be shown on 
basis. So having the T, then we can easily define any T I where I runs from 1 to N as M sub I of T, where M sub I is a functor, meaning the ith member in the n tuple T, which can uh, very simply be expressed by the customary iota operator and existential quantifiers, which we will not show here. I will also show uh, uh, the following. Let's start with H2, which is the Hilbert's definition of the existential quantifiers. It's written in you uh, there. From that, we see that on the right-hand side, the epsilon expression, epsilon u, t, c, u, o, occurs, which is just the definition in the definition which I just proposed. So according to that definition, we can now replace it by small t. If we do so, we have there on the biconditional, and if we, we change that to a simple conditional, we have if there is a U, T, C, U, O, then T, C, T, O, which is our old postlet A, T in the form 2. So you see that here, from our new postlet A sub T prime, which contains this N plus 1 explicit definitions, we can logically derive the old A sub T. And we know already that from P and A sub T, we can derive T C. Therefore, from the new A T, A sub T prime, together with P, which we remain unchanged, we can derive T C. That is, if we, if we keep the whole language, then in form 3, we can derive T C from this system here. So this system really fulfills everything that we have. It is logically equivalent to the old theory, not only O equivalent, but as uh, uninformed was, but logically equivalent to the whole theory. So it fulfills its purpose, it seems to me, and still we are in the observation lane. And there is only the one question left. You might say, what I said does not quite fit to each other. First, I said, there is only an incomplete interpretation for the theoretical terms. Nobody can specify them, they can specify their interpretation by merely referring to the uh, observational terms. And then later you will say, you claim to give explicit definitions of them. Now obviously that is incompatible. If we have no, uh, no complete interpretation, then we have no possibility of an explicit interpretation. Well, you are right, or you would be right, if we were allowed only the observational terms and customary logical constants. But the uh, Hilbert epsilon operator belongs to a small class, there are a few other examples, of logical constants of a very peculiar kind. Uh, I will call them indeterminate. They are so that their meaning is not completely specified. Uh, namely, in the sense, uh, if you write down the epsilon operator, epsilon n, that n be a variable for natural numbers, n equal 1 or n equal 2 or n equal 3. Then this total epsilon expression is an element of the class consisting of the elements 1, 2, or 3. So what we know is, that uh, let's abbreviate it by A, that either A is 1 or A is 2 or A is 3. But then if I write A is 1, or it's not the case that A identical 1, there is no way of finding out the truth of this. Not because of lack of factual knowledge, it is not a factual sense, there are only logical constants. Not in, uh, because of lack of logical information in the sense of that I do not see quickly enough the logical uh, consequences. Its meaning, the meaning of A has, by the epsilon operator, has been specified only up to a certain point. This not any of those n n numbers which are outside of the class consisting of one, two, three. 
More is not said. Just said is said and not more. So we cannot determine whether it is one or whether it is not. Now, you see, this indeterminacy is just the one which we need for the theoretical concepts if we use this theoretical, uh, this explicit definition which I used in, in my definition of T. Because I, of small t, there I defined T as that selection object which has the relation T C to O. That meaning not that, that is really not right. Any one, if there are such objects, then any one of them is, uh, may be taken as denoted by this epsilon expression. And this is exactly what we want to say by the mean postulate. So this definition says just gives just so much specification as we can give and not more, we want, we do not want to give more because the meaning should be left unspecified in some respect because otherwise the physicist could not, as he wants to, add to more and more and more postulates and even more and more correspondence postulates, thereby make the meaning of the same term more specific than they are today. So it uh, seems to me that the epsilon operator is just exactly the tailor-made uh, tool that we needed in order to give an explicit definition that, in spite of being explicit, does not determine the uh, meaning completely, but just to that extent that is needed. So that will conclude my talk. If there are any questions, then... I realize it's really already lunchtime, but if a few of you are hardy souls and can. Yes, please. Any questions? Or oh, I cannot, uh, my eyes are shut. Oh, please. Back to the, the part of your program, the distinguish between synthetic and analytic, which you then say that the synthetic set of HN, the theoretical language, are those which are P through and not a Yes. No, uh, oh yes, if we mean analytically, yes, that's right. No, they need not be P true, true and not A true. I think we should also uh, call as uh, synthetic such a sense as the temperature now is so and so much, which is not P true because it does not follow from the laws alone, but is factual. Yes, but there are senses which are not. Oh, uh, what was? Yeah, my question was. No synthetic senses may also be false. So synthetic means the same as synthetic false is uh, yes. No, no synthetic uh, two are true but not a true. And synthetic means a in the term. In, uh, in passing through the Ramsey sentence, and, uh, well, all these various alternative forms of physical theory, you require a higher order logic, don't you? Yes. Uh, because you were uh, eight decimals uh, referring to the uh, theoretical predicates. Yes. Uh, and real numbers, functions of real numbers, all we have in theoretical physics. Now, uh, some people might regard this as, uh, perhaps less satisfactory than the original form of the theory. This means some people might prefer to have a first-order language, but with uh, theoretical constants whose meaning they couldn't exactly specify, rather than these variables of higher order. 
uh, let me mention, however, that it is possible to uh, eliminate theoretical concepts by remaining always within a first-order language. Oh, of course, I said, I, I did not say there must be a higher order. There are higher order only if you take a type system and restrict the first order, let's say, to natural numbers or something uh, or another uh, sort to observe an object. I said before that this higher order may be a type hierarchy, so a type logic, or maybe a set theoretic logic. I see, but it may be a set theory, you need special assumptions on the theory. David and I were thinking of this, I think you need to require that you can prove in the original theory that there are at least as many objects as there are theoretical constants. Oh, you need a lot of uh, assumptions, of course. Uh, I mean, you, have, you want to have all the natural numbers and the real numbers and functional real numbers and so on in the ordinary sense. In addition to what we presuppose in the observation language, namely, Observable object. But your your uh, approach oh, yes, I presupposes that, uh, that the theorem is such that you can prove that there are an innumerable, say, an innumerable number of uh, You would only either put that into the logic of the theoretical yes. language or add it as a theoretical postulate. Well, even in the in the uh, logic of uh, L.O. Pine, yes. I would have, uh, of course, I would have the whole arithmetic of natural numbers, whole the theory of real numbers, and so on. Oh, yes, yeah, now I come back to what I said uh, in my comment on David Kaplan's paper. You see, from this point of view here, we do no longer make a distinction between significant and non-significant. For instance, if you take Andre's form, there are no theoretical terms. Even if you take the, uh, the ordinary form, then, uh, uh, I mean, if you take uh, theoretical terms and introduce them by the explicit definitions which I gave, you do not want to say that any uh, uh, term introduced by an explicit definition is not significant, if the terms occurring in the definitions are all significant. So I think uh, on the basis of these considerations, it seems plausible to give up the attempt of making a distinction between significant and non-significant within this language. Of course, a term that does not belong to this language at all, and where, let's say, the absolute as used by the metaphysician, I do not know in what logical type he has it, but if he says, if he says it is one natural number only, he cannot yet specify whether it is greater than seven or not, then I would say yes, then it is at least meaningful, but not yet completely specified. Now, but we can make a distinction between redundant axioms and others, because if we split up uh, any theory which we have in such parts that the whole is, uh, the content of the whole is not changed by leaving out the second part, then we call that a redundant part. Now it turns out that in the example which David Kaplan gave there, the action in the, in the first part, in the first language, the action n equals n is redundant, and in the second part, this and the uh, definitional formulas are redundant. And if we say that any terms of the language uh, we call redundant, if they occur only in redundant postulates, then in the, third, in the first language, M and N would be regarded as redundant, as uh, he said, it seems plausible to reject them. But in his uh, second language, M and N and his four defined terms would all be redundant. So they are not regarded as non-significant, but they are regarded as redundant, which does not necessarily mean that they are useless. In that case, we might regard uh, them as useless, but there are many terms which are redundant and not useless. For instance, in the third form, all the theoretical terms are redundant because they are introduced by theoretical definitions. 
only the, here they are not done in the same sense because they are not specified. So uh, we, we might say that here we could make a distinction between those which are introduced by explicit definitions on the basis of determinate terms alone and those which use indeterminate terms like the Hilbert Epsilon operator. I have not yet uh, thought through whether such a uh, distinction might perhaps be useful. It is the variable experience of anyone possibly in the time to listen to, however briefly, we intensively lack to view the truth of those species of God. But my books have a short local two seventy four of two American that will first go very temporal perspective. So we were keeping that last period.